Good evening, everybody. My name is Sarah Radcliffe, and we'll just wait for a few minutes until everyone has been able to join the meeting. We have a quite a large audience today um, from all different parts of the world for our speaker, Robbie Shilliam, who I'll introduce in a minute, but I want to make sure that everyone is connected before I do that. So, um, to start again, my name is Sarah Radcliffe and together with Sean Lazar from Social Anthropology, we're running a research network at CRASH, which is called Subaltern and Decolonial Citizenships. And today is the final one of our um, seminars this term. And um, we're absolutely delighted to welcome Robbie Shilliam, who is professor of politics at the University of, um, well, jo Johns Hopkins University. And um, he has um, a formidable reputation um, as a person who has really contributed so much to our understanding of politics and international relations in the context of what are global, imperial, and highly racialized dynamics, which encompass um, different, very diverse social, ethnic, and religious groups. And for me, his um, research really contributes to an, an understanding of how one um, can use and discuss and work with materials um, from what are considered to be marginal areas of the international system, but really bring back home to Western international studies theory and political theory, um, really powerful critiques of the kind of complacencies and um, misunderstandings that have been kind of embedded within those different um, academic traditions. Um, he has published very widely um, in journals and edited collections. Perhaps the best known of his publications recently is the Black Pacific, Anti-Colonial Struggles and Oceanic Connections, published by Bloomsbury Academic Press in 2015, in which he examines the deep global infrastructure of anti-colonial connectivity between Maori um, action, activists and various different um, African anti-colonial ideas and groups themselves. And in it, he offers a, what he calls a decolonial science of deep relation of spiritual bonds underlying the connectivity between these very varied groups. He's also um, a co-author or co-editor of a very powerful um, collection um, of edited volumes that foreground post-colonial politics and orders, decolonial visions and global dimensions of racism. I have no doubt his forthcoming book on decolonizing politics, which will be published in policy, um, with Policy Press next year, will have an equally significant impact on the debates and our conversations within and beyond international relations and political um, politics um, as an academic discipline. And alongside his academic work, which is outstanding, Robbie also plays very important roles in wider endeavors, ranging from work as a trustee for the Runnymede Trust, as an advisor to the Black Doctoral Network, and through to um, advising on various different um, museum collections and exhibitions. So without further ado, I will pass over to Robbie, um, but maybe just pause for a minute on the kind of housekeeping. Um, we are trying to nurture a form of um, horizontal respectful citizenship in this digital platform of our seminar series. So we expect everyone to um, treat each other um, well and um, considerately. Um, what we will do after Robbie's um, finished his presentation, 
we will then open up for discussion. Initially, I will read some of the questions from the chat. So if you would like to ask a question, um, please write that into the chat. Um, and at a later point, we will probably stop recording and that will allow a more um, sort of free flowing discussion between um, the members of um, the group this evening. So on that note, um, please um, um, warmly welcome Robbie Shillian. Thanks so much, Sarah, and you really made me look good. <laughs> so, so thanks for that, and thanks to everybody who's been um, involved in this series that you've been doing, and, and I'm, really, I'm really glad to be here. Imagine your whole life as just one straight line. You'd only be able to stick to one group. Your wheels would jar and shudder if they tried to change course. Life would be unsurprising. You'd know where you'd end up from where you started. Your senses would be attuned to one direction. You'd develop a certain tunnel vision. The sides of your life would be a constant motion, a kind of static streak. All that Michelle Delaney knew at the elite college in Baltimore was a static streak. For years, her mother had, given, had driven up Charles Street passing Johns Hopkins' homeward campus to turn right at 39th Street towards Edna Gardens, a medium income, owner-occupied and black Northeast neighborhood. Michelle's parents were socially aspirational, or at least they hoped to preserve and pass on their lower middle class status to their children. That's why they were committed to a college education for their eldest daughter and a prestigious college at that. The best laid plans. It's funny how Michelle never imagined that there could be a campus behind Charles, which had green and idyllic depth. All she knew was the sign by the Eastgate streaking punts. Her mother's micro-directed timetable, full of purpose and contour to the grid of the city, had paradoxically begun to unravel the family's painfully crafted master plan. If you can't even imagine the sight of your future, how could you ever inhabit it? Straight lines come from somewhere. Maleficent or careless designs of colonial rule that last an age. Strict concerns for heredity and inheritance, only my children, race shall inherit the earth. Concretize boundaries that demarcate communities and separate the good and normal folk from bad and abnormal populations. Straight lines are fundamental to racial constellations. Consider the origins of the term low rasa. 14th century meanings include a coarseness in fine cloth, a defect in poetic speech. Come late 15th century with the reconquest of Iberia from the Muslim Moors and then the conquest of the Americas via the Canary Islands, La Raza now predominantly referred to the branding of pure breed horses and the various religious lineages that made humans human. Jews, Muslims and heathens had degraded or sinful lineages compared to the Catholic who had been born into a Catholic family, no conversion or divergence. Through purity of blood, the straight line was established as the basic cosmological feature of global order 500 years long and counting. You had one irremovable root and you extended out from there. For the few whose root was virtuous and close to God, or for the better, for the rest, undoubtedly for the worst. The expectation of straight lines disciplined the motley humanity the world over. Michelle's mother sought to graft her daughter's life course onto a different branch of destiny. Education, she gambled, could bend straight lines, shift constellations. Fate came knocking one day in the form of a charity devoted to the public good. Michelle could never figure out what that term meant. Was it like a Sunday service, she once asked her mother, who assured her that at one time government had indeed administered to the public. Her father suggested she imagine praying to God for water and then asking the congregation to all pitch in with the utility bill. That was what government did when it was serving the public. Still, try as she might, Michelle couldn't comprehend doing any of those things without using transactional. And transactional was the app that she was on right now as she slouched in the living room, trying to complete her college admission forms 
with the small AC humming desperately against the quiet outside heat. A year ago, Michelle's high school had received a visit from a charity that connected neighborhood schools to elite colleges. She put her name into a lottery and was selected for a campus tour of Hopkins. Michelle had jumped out of the charity's minibus, dizziness instantly hitting her because Charles Street should have been moving and she wasn't. At the checkpoint on the east entrance, endless scans micro-targeted her profile, costs paid for by the charity. Finally processed, she stepped past the side street into green depth and blue air and a differently dizzying sense of unguided haphazard strolling alongside students only a year or two older than her, but a lifetime distant. Between Michelle and a future of 360 degree motion lay that app. Transactional was the most prominent of a suite of apps belonging to data management companies that in a short time span had been effectively delegated governance functions by most administrations in the G18. By the way, Brazil and South Africa were ejected from the G20 following their disastrous response to COVID-19, while the UK and US remained in a grouping of the world's richest economies due to the irreplaceable heritage of these countries within the fabric of the international community as the Australian representative pontificated at the time. Of course, digital risk management was not a new thing to private business, but it was between 19 and 21 that apps such as Transactional had really come into their own as platforms for administering the risk that came with the provision of public goods. Now, in the era of COVID-25, public and private risk had effectively morphed into one. Such academic, some academics labeled this a shift from public administration stroke digital risk management to digital risk administration. Actually, it had begun at Hopkins itself with its COVID dashboard. An electrical engineer called Ajit Kumar used the freely available data from Hopkins to create a virus checker app called Symptomatic. Modeled on apps that reported crime levels in neighborhoods, Symptomatic initially assessed COVID cases at a street level, giving red or green indicators. One night at dinner, Michelle's father pushed the YouTube video in front of her, featuring an academic at Morgan State University. The prof proceeded to wax lyrical on digital red lining, declaring Symptomatic to be an apartheid app. Michelle had heard of apartheid in high school, but that was something very peculiar and particular to a country called South Africa, right? Baltimore's Roland Park Company created the neighborhood just up the road from Hopkins Homewood campus. They were one of the first urban developers in the US to exclude black peoples from owning property in their planned communities. That practice came to be known as redlining. As the 20th century progressed, redlining took on different modalities. For instance, those who lived in predominantly black neighborhoods were often denied civic and financial services on account of their zip code or made to pay over the odds. It was an open secret that the redlining of neighborhoods was homologous to apartheid rule in South Africa. Put another way, from 1948, apartheid rule formalized redlining. Around the time that Kumar was developing symptomatic, Apple and Samsung updated their operating systems to include a non-optional COVID tracker that recorded the AGPS movements of the handset. This data was Bluetooth to official government agencies on the assumption that movements would be anonymized and used only to build large scale predictive models. However, beginning in those G18 states whose populist leaders had not only mishandled 19, but had simultaneously gutted any capacity for public health initiatives, AGPS data was progressively franchised to private interests and de-anonymized so long as a public health case could be made. Symptomatic was one of those companies that made the shift from Hopkins to government data and in doing so converted a public good into a function of assessing risk for predominantly private interests. In short, symptomatic turned medical diagnosis into racialized risk management. 
no surprise in a way. The pharmaceutical industry had for some time used race as a category to determine biological differences in the testing of genetic drugs. Despite the objection of many geneticists that genes were not racist. Still, the determinations held descriptive fidelity. It was just that their causes were cumulatively historical, social, economic, political, psychical, and spiritual, rather than genetic. Across the G18, and no doubt beyond too, indigenous, black, Latino, Muslim, and other ostensibly non-white communities were variously but disproportionately affected by 19 to 25 along li existing lines of comorbidity. The kind of jobs that, for example, black people's predominantly held, when combined with the tasks that their bosses tended to give them, meant that they spent much of their day undertaking dysgenic and contaminative labor, even during pandemics. Essential workers might have been the front line, still, there was a darker front line within the front line. The financial cost of illness and unemployment fell disproportionately on the front of the frontline peoples, which in turn depressed house prices in their areas and thus neighborhood desirability. And all that intensified the segregating tendencies that were already evident at the local and municipal level. When Michelle was 10, she remembered playing with a couple of white children down the road but it was a long time now since she, still in her youth, had seen anybody but black in Edna Gardens. Symptomatic, intuitively short-circuited biology with race in space. Its algorithm scaled up street level data so as to reference a vast array of zip codes, each becoming associated with one race, perhaps two non-white races, but never a mix of white and non-white races. Effectively, the app parsed the consequences of race segregation as the cause of racial difference and the numerator of risk. Practically, Symptomatic used AGPS data to determine where you spent the most amount of time, and that location provided your risk score for disease. Numbers range from one to five, one being no risk at all, five being the highest risk. In all her days so far, Michelle had never seen a green number ping up on her family or her friend's phone. The red numbers started at four. But Symptomatic also talked to other apps and in doing so laid the groundwork for digital risk administration. While Symptomatic provided the score, the transactional app provided the indemnity to undertake a range of actions. Almost all contracts of association, whether to do with work, business, civics, culture, municipality or religion, all of them ran through transaction. Associative activities took place in a locale and transactional use symptomatic to pass the difference between the COVID score of the locale where the contracted activity took place and the COVID score of the locale that, that the contracting individual predominantly spent time in. If the latter was larger than the former, then, then an indemnity was required to cover the cost of insuring against litigation for introducing disease into an area. The larger the difference between the two scores, the heftier the indemnity required to contract. Transactional was the brainchild of Rex Kutzi, a South African-born white man Naturalized as a Canadian citizen in his late teens, Kurtzi had at college sculpted a utopic vision of a tech-full future for humanity that extended life. Kurtzi's big innovation, he liked to believe, was the concept of a life drive. He ardently held to the claim that when it came to technological innovation, the means were not ethically important, only the ends mattered. The social, Kurtzi argued, was constituted through creatively aggressive action. While the means of these actions might be violent or unsavory, the actions themselves cut through existing practical and ethical barriers to greatly extend systems of accumulation and production, thus prolonging human life. Transactional, Kurtzi claimed, sought to extend lives by opening them up to any opportunity 
that might be said to mark an associational life moment, whether that be voting, employment, charity, church, healthcare, property acquisition, credit, or education. Now, it was entirely possible to register for a 19 to 25 blood test to accurately determine whether you were infected. Yet the cost of that test had to be paid up front in full and was simply prohibitive even to those aspirational families living in Edna Gardens. The only practical alternative was to pay the monthly insurance to indemnify against private litigation for spreading coronavirus outside of your zip code. And that was the sticking point. Frequenting a one or two COVID zip code for work, study, or any other associational activity basically placed the indemnity option way beyond the means of Michelle's family and pretty much every other family she knew. True, Edna Gardens was not five territory, which came in about a mile south. And a fault for COVID for her neighborhood could be doable for contracting to a one or two COVID zip code so long as the activity or membership being applied for and contracted to was a one-off or extremely short term. But the four year stint that came with an elite college degree in a one COVID zip code made four COVID indemnity costs entirely unaffordable to Michelle's family. Activists and intellectuals regularly challenged Curtsy with a tranche of questions. Which lives were sufficiently counted as human so as to be prolonged? If some people's lives were shortened in the course of the extinction of others, did it mean that they were insufficiently human? Wasn't this life energy driven by the pursuit of racialized genocide? Kurtzi never provided a counter argument, but he did react unfailingly to the South African connection as critics often made. I am a Canadian citizen, Kurtzi would bluster. Some people could it seem convert their inheritance. Is there anything less Canadian than racism and genocide? Nonetheless, it was an open secret. Everyone who felt the effect knew that transactional and symptomatic work to render digital risk administration an apartheid mode of governance. Everyday slang drew together the connections between wealth, location and race. In hair salons and barber shops, one COVID was known as one white, one wealth. Four COVID, four black for sure. Five COVID, black as red, attenuated before long to black as. The root of Fino is to show or to present. And La Raza's global constellations always plotted both physical features and behaviors into straight lines. What objects one holds sacred, who one associates with and how, how one talks, what one wears, eats, where one travels and congregates, all are as much presentation, phenotype, as skin color or hair texture. Hence, one white, one wealth, and black ass. What those who felt it knew was that in the post-public era of digital risk administration, wealth equated to location, equated to race, all of which equated the sum to almost free access to capital, opportunity, and influence. If you were one white, one wealth, then you made and remade your own heredity. You could circle, zigzag, idle, roam with pure freedom. Even if you decided to slum it in a five COVID neighborhood for a protracted period of time, and even if you thrilled at the symptomatic color shift from green to red on your phone, you could still simply pay the transaction and indemnities and proceed as normal until the algorithm eventually returned you to your one COVID zip code. That kind of freedom was a world away from Michelle, but the campus idyll still called her, just two miles southwest. She had hatched a plan. It was the kind of plan that her father could not directly agree to because to do so would be to acknowledge his digital incarceration and subservience to the apartheid act. It was the kind of plan that her mother had sanctioned, albeit through a recitation of Psalms 121. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills from where cometh my help. Joyce Moyle was one of an increasingly diminishing group of international students who came to Johns Hopkins on scholarship, in her case, from Zimbabwe. Like Michelle, 
Joyce belonged to one of those few remaining aspirational families with parents who still believed that an education could set you apart and launch you into a future of low density suburb living. Joyce has studied her way into the University of Zimbabwe, navigated around the boys, the strikes, the military incursion into campus, the emergency taxi drivers and diminished library materials to win a place on Hopkins English Literature Graduate Program. First though, Joyce had to travel to Pretoria, South Africa to conjure the magic visa from one of the three US embassies left on the continent. There, she undertook a procedure that symptomatic had made virtually obsolete in the US. Actual blood tests, one, two, three draws of blood covering all the black diseases that the United States Alien Control Services had listed on their protocols. Surprisingly, Joyce's blood confessed to no sin. On arrival at Dulles Airport, Virginia, Joyce was made to take the test again in a side room to passport control. 36 hours of lying uncomfortably on the plastic chairs and she was finally admitted to the country. Joyce met Michelle on her campus visit one year ago. Joyce had been asked to speak about international diversity and had provided a stream of consciousness that was all at once a harder indictment of the US system than even Malcolm X would have given and a diatribe about how American Blacks don't seize the incredible opportunities that the country offers them. Michelle had not really recognized herself in any of Joyce's speech, but she was enamored by the speaker's confidence. They'd kept in casual touch via messaging. One day, the conversation talked. Joyce had had to send most of her stipend back to her folks in Kodoma. Kodoma, a farming town two hours drive from Harare, the capital of Zimbabwe. A 25 outbreak in Kadoma had just combined with a local resurgence of anthrax poisoning. The poison had been laid long ago by the Rhodesian army in rural farming areas, remaining dormant beneath the soils it pushed itself up every now and then as a colonial aftercare. 25 plus anthrax had devastated both the local farms and the local markets. Joyce's parents and sisters and brothers were suffering. There was no choice, but that left Joyce in deep financial trouble, states so. Michelle had always joked that neither security nor staff could really tell her and Joyce apart. If it came down to it, all they needed to do was to harmonize their hairstyles. She had a point. Most of the security personnel who manned the Hopkins checkpoints were poorer whites and from the counties that surrounded the city. Not too long ago, cleaners, cooks, ground peoples, and security staff were all black Baltimoreans with perhaps a pinch of Latino. But then symptomatic and transactional came along. To be employed in a one COVID location like the Hopkins Homewood campus required a free COVID score at least, else the indemnity required made the wage worthless. Black security now secured only black property in black areas. And so, Three months prior to submitting her application, Michelle began to meet Joyce at the bus stop outside the Hopkins East entrance. Joyce would give Michelle her pass and she would slide through the checkpoint onto campus. See, it wasn't sufficient to give Joyce her phone to keep overnight. Symptomatic was a little cleverer than that. The app also recorded phone use and personal mobility over a period of 24 hours and aggregated that data into a pattern. Any unusual usage or movement would send a red flag with an automatic penalty that downgraded your COVID score by one point. It was simply not possible to identify each and every one of your digital and somatic habits when many of them were hidden within repetition and muscle memory. And this was why Michelle had to physically occupy the space that Joyce did on campus while her co-conspirators shared with a graduate friend just across the road off campus. But the whole plan rested on a gambit. The insurrectionary information came from WhatsApp, from a few people around the neighborhood, neighborhood who had somehow managed to land a job, a deal, a scholarship that would definitely have required the out of reach with COVID. It went like this, symptomatic, averaged out the user's residency in weekly slots for efficiency's sake. 
flags would be raised if the majority of your time was spent in a different metric neighborhood and a grinding set of documents would have to be produced to prove that you had indeed moved up to a higher location. If these documents were not forthcoming, then a red flag and a point deduction came your way instead. However, the system would not flip if you spent a minority of each week in a different metric and racial neighborhood. And that time spent elsewhere could factor positively into your COVID score. Symptomatic could only be so clever. After all, app algorithms extended a straight line of race constellation. And that was the flaw in the system, namely the extreme rigidness of theory and application that made race thinkable and effective. Digital risk administration could not imagine that you might split time across different neighborhoods. Multiplicity of racial abode, just like circling, zigzagging, errantry, was not a mode of existence that poor neighborhood people were supposed to be able to access. The algorithm said no. 500 bucks would be enough to live on, Joyce calculated before the next stipend was due. Meanwhile, Michelle calculated that moonlighting in a one white, one wealth zip code three times a week, just under half of the weekdays, might bump her score into three, opening the prospect of just about affordable indemnity and possible entrance into a world that she currently only inhabited under camouflage. At least that was the great gambit. In her quiet moments, Michelle conceded to herself that no one really knew. Just then, symptomatic flashed green. Three, Michelle's body shifted in a chair. She tapped the report button, the screen morphed back into transactional. Her eyes didn't really want to capture the whole vista at once. She saw a blur in the corner, which approximated a Hopkins logo. Tedros Makonen stepped onto the speedboat at Port, Port Andrach. Once the meeting would have taken place at the Radisson Blue in Addis Ababa, it had then moved to the UNDP office in New York after non-Africans refused to fly to the continent, and now it was to occur on board a super yacht. Palma, the capital city of Mallorca, had a world standard marina, but Tedros's location was 45 minutes car ride to the southwest tip of the island. And now he realized, as he scanned the horizon of Port Andrach, it was naive of him to have thought that the yacht would be moored directly in the port's bay. Instead, the chartered speedboat took him around three headlands, eventually depositing him just off the coast of Sad Dragonera, an island off an island and uninhabited at that. That's how these people like to conduct their, best, their business, Tedros reflected, not only away from their stakeholders, but away from humanity at large. Tedros worked for UNDP Africa's Regional Service Center, specifically in the area of dis disaster risk management. Work was chaotic, no surprise. Parts of the African continent were experiencing a triple crisis of climate, COVID and crops. Many African states were desperate for funding to build capacity in public health, as well as nationally and regionally, coordinated food redistribution networks, but that money was no longer forthcoming. In some ways, Ted Ross and his fellow travelers had won the hardest battle, yet lost the war. All of them, apparatchiks of medium growth states of the global south that had become regional hubs, all of them were now firmly in command of the offices and the orientation of the UNDP. But just as they had won such a victory, G18 states had effectively recused themselves of any meaningful involvement in the formal institutions of global governance. As they empty chaired, the funding dissipated. Currently, the UNDP was reduced to a bureaucratic statistics machine. There were no resources to address problems, only to record them. The easiest way to explain the loss of this leverage was to compare two indicators <clears throat> that, over, that had over the last years contended for influence in the halls of the UNDP, the Human Development Index, the HDI, and Overview. HDI was designed to counter the reduction of development to economic growth by flexing education and living standards into the equation, as well as by paying attention to various inequalities on the national level. 
overview was a very different indicator, but it was the one that the vicarious elites of the G18 countries used to determine which states they should bilaterally invest in. Overview was like an international version, a systematic and transactional all bundled into one. It had been developed by a nameless consortium of investment companies, drawing from the calculus of political risk that had long directed their investment strategies across geopolitical terrain. Overview took the historical rates and numbers of infection in each country from UNDP data and scaled it according to GDP. The premise was that the richer the economy, the better it could deal with COVID. To arrive at its one to five score, Overview did not parse quality of growth nor distribution of wealth or illness as HDI did. All this resulted in Overview providing a paradoxical set of evaluations. The societies that had been most destabilized by COVID, for example, the US and the UK, scored well in theory due to their GDP. While in practice, they had consistently performed appallingly when it came to the human cost of pandemics. Whereas those that had succeeded in their public health measures despite their GDP, for example, Senegal, Botswana, had been burdened with an impossible to shape shithole industry slang for a five COVID score. The higher the score, the higher the interest rates on any bilateral loans. And if one suffered a shithole to receive any loan at all, one would have to put up a portfolio of natural resources as indemnity for political instability. The initial country scores that overview generated after COVID-19 had remained the same right the way through to 25. This didn't surprise Tedros. He knew that Overview's purpose was to act as a credentializing instrument by which finance capital and associated insurance industries could leverage what was left of the development project. In fact, Overview leveraged development at both the state level and the individual level. You could download the Overview app and set up a citizen account so long as you resided in any country outside of the G18. In this instance, Overview used the same UNDP database as the HDI did to parse the worthiness of individuals seeking microcredits. The database aggregated COVID rates by reference to each country's equivalent measure of a zip code. Then the Overview app deployed the symptomatic algorithm to parse the data. Depending on the country, data could be regionally patchy and quite coarse, but this coarseness was no less so than overview's evaluations of states. The speedboat lapped up to the stern of the super yacht. Tedros looked up, go where you want, and arrive with luxury by tacking into whatever wind or current the winds decide. There are no tracks laid down on the ocean. Anchor where you want, run your own quarantine and board a guard from your own deck. Pay no tax to anyone. Live as if you're the only human left on earth. Servants don't count. Then Tedros thought of the majority of citizens from non-G18 states. When it came to overview, they were the state and the state was them. And these states had heavy adjectives, African, Asian, Pacific. Their employment in the constellations of race was so cardinal that no trade wind could shift them. Actually, the domestic shifts within G18 countries towards digital risk administration were even more giant when scaled up to the global level where the idea of publics was already problematic. Public management, the quaint idea of the late 20th century, promoted the running of the state apparatus as if it were a business. Now, in most domestic jurisdictions, a billionaire class firmly occupied the seats of government. There was no longer an as if qualification to the commandment. Billionaires ran state apparatuses as direct extensions of their financial interests. The individuals might come and go and return, but the family interests remain. Government figures who interacted with international organizations did so purely to find the most lucrative investment opportunities for their portfolios. USAID, for instance, had become a giant fund manager for the family cabals that rotated through government offices with the help of overview at both the state and citizen levels. Yes, thought Tedros, 
racism was now unmediated, the direct function of private interests that were naturalized in biological inheritance. Those who had the capacity to play the market were destined to inherit the earth. Yet here he was, a rare meeting, to try and sell the idea of a global fund that would not be administered by apps and racialized disease vectors, a fund that equitably addressed basic need for justification. Even markets require external stabilizing measures from time to time. An old argument, it smelt old, but it was all he had. Tedros climbed the short ladder onto the latest super yacht built by the Chinese high-end luxury company, Bucolic. The effulgence, that was what the name painted in silver on the gunwheel said. It was the property of Carson Collin, current US Secretary of State and a member of the most prominent black billionaire family on the planet. Interestingly, each Colin generation was becoming lighter than the previous one. Colin had loaned out the yacht to a lower functionary of USA who thrilled at the prospect and sent the bill to the UNDP, of course. At the top of the boarding ladder, Tedros could see the red shores of the testing station clapping in the breeze. He began the short climb, the humanity, he said to himself. From Harare, the Bulawayo Road starts out fat, then past Norton, it slims. Through one, two small towns, a burst of activity punctuating the quiet fields and occasional roadside maze or fruit cellar. Come Kadoma, you can carry on, passing through the bus transit area, or you can side off into the other side of town, the commercial sector. As soon as you turn, the asphalt gorges and riverines. Local politicians have for decades siphoned off any tax money. Ironically, their imported cars are too delicate and sophisticated to handle the local roads. A ways to go yet. After the commercial part of town, you turn right again. The Rimuka Road starts fat too, but slims down quickly past small houses that serve as a kaleidoscope of businesses, you name it, it can be repaired. Left past the police station and a quick right to arrive at the back of the township's shopping mall. Rimuka Township suffered greatly from the combined anthrax and COVID outbreak a little while ago. That fact might surprise you, given the hum of low-grade activity, but look closer. In the scheme of the social fabric is stretched further than anyone thought it could, almost transparent. Still, with every tightening comes opportunity for someone. She has a name, but it's not for you. She's been waiting patiently for the entire afternoon, just outside Mr. Mandada's store. He comes out with the last phone for the day. A woman called Joyce Moyle has just deposited it. Miss Moyle has been coming every day for the past week, but there's been no eye contact, just straight into the car and gone. It doesn't really matter, recognition is hardly necessary or expected. Mr. Mandala holds the money and will not release her share until the next morning comes safe return. So she leaves in a slow pace with her bag of five phones. It's a long walk down roads with ever dwindling densities of houses until they finally morph into patchwork fields. Soon partial brick walls litter the sides of her path overgrown, but reclaimed as homes by tarpaulin, sometimes nothing at all, just naked chairs and a small gas stove with smoke marking habitation. A rusted sign says New Ngezi, but the following words, she's always thought they originally said growth point, but she can't be sure, have been written over with liberated territory. She's pretty sure she knows who was the author of that palimpsest. With that thought, she starts to errantly navigate partially formed maze of stunted walls. With random precision, she veers off track down a long winding dust path over a bank and through a small piece of bush, arriving at her destination within three hours, dusk is falling. The small clearing has its own kind of order. Sissi Vangu is tending to the imperfect rows of dark blue, black and green. Is that her real name? Probably not, but it's fitting. Sissi, sister, Vangu, Mai. She is a sister to everyone. The first night that she spent at Sissi Vangu's, she had asked why Sissi had planted the small 
black maize. Sissi Vango explained that this variant was more drought resistant than the ubiquitous white maize, yet also yielded a higher calorific intake. The larger white variety had been grown on white farms during Rhodesian times, and many of these farms could afford big irrigation systems while small scale farmers could not. Why, Sissi Vango had asked, is white mealy meal a sign of good living when poor black people would survive far better if they planted the black? Woody Vangu is sitting in his favorite shaded spot. He's reading a battered copy of a book. They're always battered. This one is red with a purple stroke and a top, title top left, A Dying Colonialism. She remembers another book from her last visit, a thicker one. Ah, yes, it's still there, top of the pile, entitled Black Reconstruction, written by a Frenchman, she guesses. She knows without any doubt that this erudite brother to everyone is the author of the new Ngezi Palimpsest, because on more than one occasion, over a meal at Sadza and Nerewo, he has explained the concept to her. When we fought roads, we carved out liberated territory so that we could live the right way without any shenanigans from the colonizing forces. We did so again when we fought our own apartheid under Smith. Then when we fought Zanu, we still do it now and he would glint at her bag of funds when we fight over them. Buddy Vangu loves the flourish of a rhetorical argument well made. He tells it as if he has no idea that he's told it a hundred times already. This, she knows, is the right one to offer to them both the bond notes before they have to ask for their fee. Buddy is right. It is a digitally liberated territory, or at least, there are no phone masks anywhere nearby. If you bothered to think that the area needed surveillance, surveillance you might task a satellite, you'd never bother. So instead, the AGPS on all phones in the area reports a no. You stay for eight or more hours out here and you don't get categorized. The algorithm waits. Now, just spend a few hours a day in a free COVID spot in a car on the street under a tree with some roasted maize. And yes, there are those areas around, even in Kadoma, and your score picks right up. You might even be able to afford some cash from overview citizen app, and on such slim margins, local empires have been born. Do spirits move in a straight line, shadowing the living, or do they freewheel above and around constricted soul? She's one of many fun ones colloquially known as Ma Moba Mamwea, the mobile spirits. They dwell in the nighttime places that the phone owners abject. Null is not nothing. Null is an uncalculable valuation. Soon Sissi Vangu takes her by the hand and she knows it's time to sleep. As they retreat into the low warm light of the Rondavu, Buddhi Vangu starts to arrange his tarpaulin for the night just at the circumference where the light falls on the ground outside. She prepares for bed. Silence and the monotony of routine strains her mind. Do they have children? Away in Harare or South or London or America, she asks. Sis Bangu pauses. Yeah, they do. And they work in Murungu. But she doesn't say where and the word does not reveal. Murungu means white man but it also means boss. The term fuses race, position, and power. A black Zimbabwean could be a Murungu just as much as a white American. To be a boss is to become white, and to be white is to be boss. Maybe, she offers, after they've saved the phone fees for a few months, they could join their children. And what then, Sissi Vangu returns to offer value added. Work for Murungu too? Would that be your part? Or Maybe you're saving to become a Murungu yourself. The words fall to the ground. Ah, uh, no, I don't know, I haven't thought about it that much. The lie hangs in the air. Starting afresh with eyes trained on her own routine, Sissi Vangu explains. There are the black workers, there are the white workers, and then there are the Murungu. But for our part, we want to see the coming of the Lord. Thanks guys. Thank you very much, Robbie. That was um, such a rich account of 
of different people and processes and, and the connections. Um, and certainly for myself, it was uh, an account of the connection between the sort of COVID pandemic and, and the, the digital world in which we increasingly live that I, I was unfamiliar with. Um, and uh, I very much welcome the way that you link it to particular individuals and, and their various different practices to try and um, work with and around um, these sorts of situations that they find themselves in.